what is a healthy church? A lot of times today, people don't know, they're curious, is it the music, you know, is it the preaching, is it how friendly the people are, how good the parking is, is it the pretty building, what is a good church? Uh, this is a book that would be useful, I hope, for anybody, any Christian who's curious about how they can follow Jesus along with other people, what the local church is to be like, what their experience of being a disciple of Jesus Christ should be like. I've enjoyed reading Mark Dever's book. It is, um, uh, he has a way of just keeping things simple. And uh, so it's, this is one of those elements that is a, not a difficult concept to understand, but it always helps me to kind of put it in full context. And I'm going to give you a little test before we get started, and then we'll look at it later. Um, these are all elements of salvation. There's probably some other things that could be included. Uh, but I'm going to let you take just a few moments and um, set these from what happens first, and then what happens second, and then just go through, and there's eight of them there. And uh, I'm going <laughs> No, you're in a theology class. You're safe. <laughs> Now, you may not have all those defined, I understand, but uh, we'll touch base on some of those, but just take a moment and kind of place those in order. Some of you are probably experiencing a challenge in some of that, and, and, and that's okay because theologians over the centuries have struggled with some of the order. <laughs> yeah, well, it happens pretty quick, so. <laughs> well, Dever, in his book, defines uh, conversion fairly simply. He says, in the simplest terms, conversion equals repentance and faith. And so I'm going to look at those two words uh, for just a moment. Uh, I'm not going to be greatly detailed in these definitions. Uh, the word says a lot about both. Uh, but repentance, uh, the word means to turn around and proceed in the opposite direction, but really, it literally means a new mind. Uh, I always look at it as agreeing with what God says is true and then adjusting my life to it. 1 Corinthians 2.16, For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. The Holy Spirit in his work has given us the ability to be able to discern what it is that is God's design, his desires, uh, his will. Romans 12.2, uh, 12, you're familiar. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed or metamorphosed by the renewing of your mind. It implies us being something new, being created new. And then faith. I mean, there's a lot of things could be said about faith. It's a persuasion, a conviction based upon hearing the Word of God particularly. One man said it this way, faith is belief and trust, supernatural belief and trust that is always based in the reality of a real-time, ongoing, powerful, interactive relationship with the Almighty Creator of the universe. God speaks, and then faith comes. Uh, there are elements of faith. Uh, there's conviction. Uh, I have a, uh, a solid ground to stand on. 
because of what God has said. And then I, I surrender. I, I, I adjust myself, and out of that, my life is changed. Those are the elements of faith. So, I want to answer a couple of questions today. So, what is man's condition that would require him to have to repent and exercise faith? I mean, what does the scripture say is true of man? Well, we know that the scripture says that we were created in God's image. And then the scriptures balance that with... Uh, what a depraved state. Um, to be honest with you, when I came to know the Lord, I came to know the Lord young. And the process of realizing who I was before I was saved has been a process. I grew up in a family, and, and many of you were blessed with the gift of a heritage of, of um, godly people. I was taken to the church regularly. I had a good view of the local body and its work. Um, when I came to the Lord, much was said about hell. There was a little bit of fear there about experiencing something eternally like that. Uh, but the Lord had been working on my heart before that, that time. But I was a pretty good kid and uh, grew up in a pretty good situation. Uh, solid parents. Um, just a, a good situation and it was later on that I had to learn what was my condition before I actually came to know the Lord well let's consider it Jeremiah 17 says the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick who can understand it in uh, that passage verse 13 23, it says, Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then you also can do good who are accustomed to doing evil. He's saying, if you could do that with the Ethiopian and the leopard, then, yeah, if you're accustomed to doing evil, you can do good. But his implication there is, you're evil. You can't do good. New Testament has a way of saying it in the sphere of sin. We, we abide in the sphere of sin, which is we may do good acts, but it's in the context of sin. We're unable to do good. There's not, we're not righteous. We have no understanding. We have no desire or inclination to seek God. Romans 3, these are passages you're familiar with Romans 3 10 through 12 as it is written there's none righteous not even one there is none who understands there is none who seeks for God all have turned aside together they have become useless well there's a contrast to what the local church should be there is none who does good there is not even one We're dead <laughs> in our trespasses and sins. We're dead in the sphere of trespasses and sins. And you know this passage in Ephesians 2, 1 and verse 5, 2, part, part of verse 5. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Just clear. <clears throat> we're under the dominion of the world, the flesh, and the devil. Continuing in Ephesians, says, In which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. You know, we still struggle with some of those things. But it's good news to know what the Lord did with all that. Scripture says we're born into the world a son of Adam. Romans 5, verse 12 through 14, and it continues on. But 
It says, therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who was a type of him, Jesus, who was, who was to come. We just, it's our inheritance. We're a slave to sin. Again, it's pretty easy to understand from Paul writing to the Romans, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. Those are some really hard uh, images of what we were before we came to know the Lord. Our will is in bondage to evil. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually appraised. <clears throat> you know, when I... <laughs> I'm sorry about this, but when I read that verse, I think of Bill Maher. And others like him. I, I used to get just really anxious about when he talks. But what I realize is, it's all foolishness to him. He's in a condition that we were all in. And what it began to produce in me was compassion for the man. I began to pray for him, that his eyes would be uh, enlightened to the truth of the gospel. And that's what it'll do for us. When we understand what we came out of, it creates great compassion for those who are in it. One writer stated it this way, we we're born with a heart uninhabitable. I tried to find a picture, an image online of a heart uninhabitable and <laughs> I can't even find a picture conceiving that. But there's no room for anything but myself. Seems in recent years, modern evangelism has kind of felt the need to eliminate the bad news. <laughs> You know, we're all created in the image of God and, and uh, we're good. And if you, if you don't add the bad news, then what you have is we're all children of God. The whole planet is just, we're, we're, we all got to look out for each other because we're all God's children. That's a false gospel. It's another gospel, Paul would say. We must be confronted with the danger and the helplessness of our condition. So then, what is needed for man to move toward repentance and faith? This is um, found in your book. Uh, this is uh, a later edition of the New Hampshire Confession of Faith. And uh, it's uh, the confession that Capitol Hill Baptist Church in D.C. Has, has accepted for their church. Uh, let me read this to you. We believe that repentance and faith are sacred duties and also inseparable graces. And then key in right here, wrought in our souls by the regenerating Spirit of God. Whereby, when that happens, whereby being deeply convinced of our guilt, danger and helplessness, and of the way of salvation by Christ, we turn to God with unfeigned Contrition, confession, and supplication for mercy, at the same time heartily receiving the Lord Jesus Christ as our prophet, priest, and king, and relying on him alone as the only and all-sufficient Savior. And the key word there that turns that statement is that word regeneration. The Holy Spirit regenerating our souls. That word really, really means reborn. It was used when Jesus confronted Nicodemus in John 3. When we talk about being made new creatures, 
which that's a familiar passage you know in 2 Corinthians 5. That's what it's talking about. It's talking about the rebirth. An action, an activity of the Holy Spirit. That passage also says that old things are passed away. What are the old things? Well, the old things is our, our antagonism and rebelliousness against God. It's our warring against Him in His ways. That's the old things. Our blindness to the truth. That's, that's the old thing. Deadness. Slavery. Those are the old things that have passed away. And then we are indwelt by God. The Holy Spirit finds, as He does His work, a place to inhabit. So, for a minute, let's go back to our test. Probably the outside, the, the first few and the last few, most of you got. I mean, there's agreement on those throughout the ages. When we talk about um, election, I mean, that happened before the foundation of the world. The Lord did that work. And then when you, when you, after you deal with election, you deal with Jesus' work, the atonement. And then there's the calling. And then there's confusion in the theological world. Okay. Does conversion come first? Do we repent and exercise belief? And then comes regeneration? Or does regeneration happen first because without us being enlightened by the Holy Spirit and being reborn, we are, are in enmity against God. So you may have those one way or another. And then, of course, we uh, experience justification. Probably the last three you got, justification. And then today, th actually those are all past what we've just talked about. And then uh, today, presently, we go through sanctification. And then in the future, we'll uh, find our glorification. So, there has been confusion. But you know what? The scripture does reference in many places um, re regeneration preceding conversion. And I'm going to go through some of those. And I'm going to use New American Standard, but I think New American Standard, I understand why they translated it the way they did. I think... Um, it has brought some confusion, uh, but we'll talk about that. First John 2.29 says this, If you know that He is righteous, you know, uh, you're, you're convinced, that's an exercise of faith, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of Him. You know that everyone that practices righteousness is born of Him. Now, all these passages I'm going to use in the New American Standard translates is born. The word there is a perfect tense in the Greek, which just means that it's a past action that has continuing results in the present. And so the is is getting at the present results. But sometimes when you read the translation, it, it, uh, someone who's not looking at it carefully will not think of it that way. And we'll look at some passages here in just a minute that show that. 1 John 3, 9 says, No one who is born, um, really in, in uh, that could be translated no one born, or no one who has been born, has been a past, you get the idea of the past and its effect in the present. No one who is born of God practices sin because 
his seed abides in him. God's seed abides in him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. Or, I think a better translation, has been born of God. 1 John 4, 7 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Or, everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. <clears throat> Here's the one that can throw some. 1 John 5, 1 says, Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Now think about that. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. That sounds like I exercise belief first and then I'm born of God. And what he's saying in that passage because of that tense is whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is the evidence that they have been born in God. That's what that passage is saying, and it brings a lot of confusion uh, with folks when they read that passage uh, with an is. Uh, I'm a musician, and so I enjoy when we see some of these truths spelled out in song. Uh, and can it be, you're familiar with that second verse, long my imprisoned spirit lay. My condition Fast bound in sins and nature's night. And it's just an explanation of my depravity. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. Regeneration. I woke. <laughs> it's a great word. I woke. The dungeon flamed with light. I was able to see. I repent. I believe. My chains fell off. My heart was free. And I rose, went forth, and followed thee. It's interesting, as I was preparing this, I had already prepared services for this week. And um, I was amazed thinking through this, um, not while Mark was preaching, but thinking through this during the worship time <laughs> and the singing time of our worship. And, uh, and realize some of the words that came out, to God be the glory, O perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, to every believer, the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Now that's post-regeneration, but again it was on my mind as I was preparing. We sang, O great God. I was blinded by my sin and had no ears to hear your voice. That's it. I mean, that was condition. Did not know your love within. Had no taste for heaven's joys. Then your spirit gave me life. Opened up your word to me. Through the gospel of your son. Gave me endless hope and peace. <coughs> And then we sang the offering song. The sun cannot compare to the glory of your love. There's no shadow in your presence. And then it says, No mortal man would dare to stand before your throne, before the Holy One of Heaven. It's only by your blood, and it's only through your mercy, Lord, I come. Um, you know, this experience is not necessarily a, a deep emotional experience, but uh, one thing that Dever makes clear is that there is evidence. There is fruit of change. Um, that's offensive. I, I don't understand why, but that is really offensive to many. Teaching kids in school, especially high school kids, who all along have felt they're saved, but live just like the world. I mean, they are in control. They are blind to truth. I, I, I mean, there's no evidence of salvation. But just to question it brings great offense. And it's, it's, it's a sad thing because we're talking about something in the balance that's serious. 
So I just want to remind you, uh, I know you've read the book, but I want to remind you uh, and myself of those things that uh, show, its, show conversion, a healthy view of conversion uh, in a healthy church. Well, it'll come out in the preaching. You know, messages will be true to the gospel. Um, you know, it's interesting. I have a brother <laughs> that lives in, in uh, Texas that goes to a church that I would call a grace church. I don't mean that in a bad way, except um, they, don't, um, they just have this real strong view of grace, and they've kind of eliminated all the bad, the bad news. And uh, I may not rem remember all of Mark's messages, but that one I really remember because while he was preaching, I was thinking of my brother sitting out there. Because Mark, uh, the part of that message that was really powerful was the bad news. And um, my brother missed the turning point in that message when it talked about the good news. Understanding the bad news, you had to understand the bad news to really grasp the good news. And um, when we left and had a meal afterwards, uh, I could tell that was he was really struggling with that. That that I was in a church that didn't have it have it right, have it together. Well, a healthy church has it has a balance there. They understand both, and it's not a bad thing to understand both. He shares with us that and we see it in the requirements for participation in the Lord's Supper and baptism. There's, we don't just baptize someone without examination. We understand it's important for them to understand what happens when they are converted and that they can express that. Um, a third one is in expectation for membership and we're kind of walking that path right now. Um, we're doing it with our Hispanic folks, our friends in the other side of our building. Um, this month we'll be, we're going through a, a members class for them. But full intent is for us as members to grasp what it means to be a member. Um, I, I would suspect that some might look at what our desire for our members to be, might look at that and say, if I'm signing up for that, I'm not sure I, I, I can, and that would be okay. But it'd be important for us to have a strong view of what our expectations are for members that uh, 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 join together with this body in ministry. And then, uh, in our unwillingness to view sin lightly. Um, that includes accountability. We, we're ex exercising some of that here. And encouragement. Those are uh, important aspects of um, holding one another um, in light of the gospel, in light of the truth of the scripture. It may include rebuke. Uh, some type of church discipline is practiced. Again, uh, a conversation that we as pastors have, have discussed and, and looked into. The necessity for us as we come together to say, you know what, I, I know I, I'm not all together all the time and I need uh, to be able to give brothers permission when they see me acting in other than uh, an, an attitude of Jesus that the freedom to walk into my life and say, you know, that, that's not... God's way. Uh, that's, not, um, that's not an attitude that our Savior would desire for us here. And so uh, important uh, for us to see those things in one another. Uh, we're not talking about a witch hunt that scares some congregations and that's why they don't press in on those things because they feel like it's going to open up the door for... Uh, us to begin to slam the body of course obviously that's not the intent of church discipline church discipline has to do with reconciliation and health in the church uh, Paul was clear there were some things that that the church should have been shamed about because they permitted it to go on in their congregations so 
That's conversion. I think it's important for us to recognize that uh, we have a responsibility to, uh, to see the truth, uh, to be convinced of it, to uh, step out in obedience to it, and allow the Lord to change our lives. That's, that's conversion. It's, it's repentance, which I heard a message one time that said repentance is a good thing. It is. We, sh we shouldn't be so afraid of it sometimes. It's a good thing in faith. But we are so helpless without the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit in our lives to illumine, our se to illumine us to the truth. Uh, it's a work that He does and it should be something that we are daily grateful for. Let's pray. Father, I thank You that um, You've taken every man in this room Every man that will hear this message, Lord, uh, that knows you, you've taken them from a condition of uh, the worst and then lavished us with the best. And for this, Lord, we are grateful. We understand that we are even post-regeneration, we understand that we are helpless without you. And we find that you receive the most glory when we walk dependent on you. So continue to purify our hearts toward that end, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.